Hello, my name is David. I am here to tell you about Cap'n Proto and Rust, which are two things that excite me very much and that I think work very well together for building distributed systems. Uh, but before I uh, get into them, I want to tell you a little bit about Sandstorm, which is the project that Cap'n Proto was designed to make possible. Sandstorm is an open source platform that dramatically simplifies the process of running your own personal server. So Sandstorm lets you install web apps on your server as easily as you would install mobile apps on your phone. And moreover, it strongly sandboxes those apps to protect your security and privacy. So imagine getting a unified experience with uh, webmail collaborative document editing, photo sharing, file backup, music streaming, blogging, um, and so on, all while minimizing the amount of trust you need to place in the developers of those apps, and also while getting to choose uh, where exactly those apps are hosted. So you could host uh, a Sandstorm instance on a box in your living room, or you could uh, use a shared hosting service. Apps in Sandstorm can communicate with each other, and with the outside world, but only, only through certain well-defined and precisely controllable interfaces. So for example, a, an RSS reader app might need to make external HTTP requests, or like a webmail app might need to send email, or more interestingly, a photo app might need to talk to an address book app to get a list of your friends. Uh, by design, um, an app gets none of these permissions uh, by default. And what we want is for a way to allow uh, the user to grant such capabilities on a case-by-case -case basis and to manage them in an understandable way. Cabin Proto is the communications layer that was designed to make that possible. So Cabin Proto provides high-level abstractions that let us reason about things like the flow and confinement of authority, you know, like who's allowed to do what. Um, moreover, Cap'n Proto is extremely efficient and has implementations in a bunch of programming languages, so it's feasible for us to use Cap'n Proto pervasively throughout Sandstorm. So to say that again, um, we insist that all communication in Sandstorm must go through Cap'n Proto, and that gives us a handle on what's going on so that we can make guarantees about certain important security properties. OK, so that's the why. Uh, but what, what exactly is Cap'n Proto? Well, here are some things that are not Cap'n Proto. XML, JSON, protocol buffers, Thrift, Avro, Ice Core, blah, blah, blah. There's a long list. Um, I hope to convince you that if you're using one of these things, then perhaps you should consider using Cap'n Proto as an alternative. OK, finally, some sort of definition. Cap'n Proto is a type system that's designed to enable fast, robust, secure, multi-language distributed computing. Uh, and I will be making this definition concrete for the rest of this talk. And the way that I'll be doing that is by walking through some usages of Cap'n Proto working within the Rust programming language. And I hope that as I uh, show you the main features of Cap'n Proto, um, it will also become evident that Rust is particularly well suited for supporting those features. Here is the example. We have two things, um, a photo album and an image analyzer. And the photo album has a bunch of photographs. The image analyzer has an algorithm. Here we're saying it's in this Rust uh, source code file, analyze image.rs. Um, and say the image analyzer can perform object detection. It can say, uh, here in this photograph, uh, in this bounding box, there's a cat. Um, in this bounding box, there's a person. And we, what we want to happen is for the photo album to send some pictures over um, and to get a list of detected objects back. So we will be using Cap'n Proto to describe this interaction. That is, we will be using Cap'n Proto to assign types to the messages that we're passing back and forth. The way we do that is we write a schema file. 
here's a schema called image.catmp. We define some types in the schema, and we send it to the schema compiler and ask it to generate some code for us. In our case, we ask for some Rust code. And we give that Rust code to each of our clients, and that gives uh, each client a way to uh, send, receive, and manipulate values of those types that we've defined. And once we have that, we can uh, perform the communication. And I'm being a bit vague about like what exactly the photo album and the image analyzer are. Um, let's just say for now they're just like processes and they're communicating through some two-way channel. I'll work up to the case when they're separate sandstorm apps in their own sandboxes. I should say now that types in Cap'n Proto describe both data and capabilities. Uh, so to start in the example, we'll just be talking about data, but capabilities are where like all the really exciting action is in Cap'n Proto, so I'll be working up to that. Um, but for now, you can just uh, keep in mind that data, when we're talking about data, we're talking about serialization. And when we're talking about capabilities, we're talking about remote procedure calls, more or less. So let's define some types. Here's a start to our schema file. We're defining two types. We have a struct called color that has three fields, red, green, and blue, each of which is an unsigned 8-bit integer. And we have a struct called image, uh, which also has three fields. Two of them are unsigned 16-bit integers, width and height, and one is a list of colors. Uh, and here I have a comment saying that that list of colors represents like a two-dimensional image uh, in row major order. And I could have instead chosen to do list of list of color. Um, I'm doing it this way because it lets us define some interesting functions later. So once we have our types, we can send it to the schema compiler. And we generate some code, some Rust code that looks a little bit like this. I've commented out a lot. Uh, and normally, you wouldn't actually need to look at this. I'm just showing it to you so you get an idea of what's going on. So here, we're just seeing uh, that top struct um, color. And that gave us a Rust module called color. And inside of that module, we have a reader and a builder. And each of those has some accessor methods. The reader has get red, get green, get blue. Those correspond to the fields that we defined. Similarly, the builder would have getters and setters and a way to cast or a way to convert to a reader. OK, let's, let's use that. Here's some client code uh, that maybe is, is being that uh, the image analyzer would write. It's a function called pixel at that takes three arguments, an image and an x and a y coordinate, and it returns the pixel at those coordinates. And here we're just undoing that row major uh, order encoding that I talked about. Um, so I just want to point out that here we're in the, in the signature of the function, we're referring to types uh, that are defined in that generated code, uh, image reader and color reader. And we're using accessor methods that uh, are defined on those types, again, in the generated code. Uh, and here we're using a get method, which is part of the Cap'n Proto runtime. So pixels was a list of colors. That gets mapped into this struct list of colors, which is a type that's defined in the runtime. So just some more code. It's not terribly interesting. I just wanted to show a few more things. This is another function called average pixel. Um, it iterates through all the pixels in an image and computes it, the average for each of the colors. I just wanted to point out that the, uh, the pixel list, you know, it just acts like a collection. You can iterate over it. And I wanted to point out setter methods act as you would expect. OK. Let's define some more interesting types. So th these are the types of the return objects. Once the image analyzer is done doing its thing, uh, it will send us an analysis result, which contains a list of detected objects. Now, each detected object is either a person or a cat. Um, and each detected object has a bounding box. The important bit here is this union keyword. 
Uh, it means that we can define tagged unions uh, in our schema. It lets us define uh, data that has an or relationship. So a detected object is either a person or a cat. Uh, and this might seem like, a, like such a small thing, but in my opinion, like this is huge. Um, this means that data in Captain Proto is really just algebraic data types, um, which really lets us uh, naturally talk about all kinds of data. And yeah, and if, if we're using a language that has, uh, if, if we're using a programming language that has native support for algebraic data types, we can hook into uh, cool things provided by that, like pattern matching and uh, exhaustiveness checking. So Rust is one such language. Let's see what the gener or, yeah, let's see what it looks like to use the generated code here. I'm not going to actually show you the generated code. So here's a function that might be. So I guess the photo album would use this because it gets the uh, detected object back and then it wants to print it. Um, and so here I'm showing pattern matching on uh, the object. We're dealing case by case with what that object could possibly be. Uh, the match is a Rust keyword. Uh, it's how you do pattern matching. And, and the which method is a generated method uh, on the detected object. And that's just like sort of the, uh, the cat and proto half of, of the pattern match. And so we deal with the cases one by one. If it's a person, we get uh, the person bound to the p variable, and we can call person-specific methods on it. If it's a cat, we can call cat-specific methods on c, which is uh, bound to the cat. And we are forced by the exhaustiveness checker to deal with the case when it's neither a person or a cat. And this is because we want to be able to deal with uh, the future when someone might add a new variant to that union. So let's jump ahead. Uh, yeah. So someone might add a dog in the future, and we want to be backwards compatible. Um, we don't want to have to recompile all of our code if someone changes the schema like that. So let me just go back. So the, the which method actually returns um, an option type. It returns either one of the things we know about or nothing representing uh, the case when we're in the future and some, something new was given to us. OK. Is that OK, so, so to summarize what I've shown you so far, I've, I've shown that Captain Proto lets us define types in a schema language outside of Rust, and then lets us use those types within Rust in a way that's nearly as convenient as if we had defined them within Rust natively in the first place. What I haven't said very much about is like why would we, we would bother going through that whole rigmarole. Um, and the answer is mobility. All the types that we define through Captain Proto um, gives us data that, that is mobile. So we can uh, sh share such data um, and use it from any programming language that has a Cap'n Proto implementation, including you know, C++, OCaml, Go, Lua, uh, Rust. There's a whole list of them. Now, what really uh, distinguishes Cap'n Proto is the way that it provides that mobility. A value in Cap'n Proto is mobile because it has exactly the same representation wherever it lives, whether that's in memory or on the, on the wire, on the network, or persisted to storage somewhere. There is no encode or decode step. A value is just a segmented sequence of bytes. It's just some buffers. And those builders and readers that I was showing you before, they, they actually just contain some pointers into those buffers. And the accessor methods are just you know, directly manipulating the bytes of the buffers. OK, so the picture in memory looks something like this. I want you to imagine that this purple rectangle is a sequence of bytes representing a Cap'n Proto message we'd like to read. Um, at the top level, we have a message reader. Um, so we're in Rust. Um, this is an object that's responsible for managing the memory. So it owns the buffer. And the message reader then lets us form typed references to the interior of the buffer. So we can like, get the root. And if the root is a, um, an image, we would get this image reader. And then we can continue traversing the message from the image reader. So an image has a bunch of pixels in it. So yeah, each pixel is a color. OK, cool. Um, so that's what it looks like. So there are lots of advantages to uh, doing things in this way. Uh, for one, it's extremely fast. 
um, like, so when we uh, call those accessor methods, they actually get, um, so in Rust and in C++, they get inline, and like the cost of it is essentially the same as the cost of dereferencing a field of a native struct. So that's super cheap. And like these things, the, these pointer things, these readers, they actually just, they get allocated on the stack. So like the only piece of memory that ever gets allocated, like if at all, is this big chunk of memory. So that's pretty cheap. Um, and and um, as I alluded to before, you can do cool things like just using the mmap system call to, to bring a Cap'n Proto message directly into memory and just operate on it like that. Um, but this approach also brings a few engineering challenges, as you might imagine. One is that we need to make sure that these pointers to the interior of the message don't outlive uh, the, the buffer itself. Now, if you're willing to pay the price for garbage collection, that's not a problem. But in a language like C++, you end up having to admonish users, like, just like, you know, be careful. Um, program in such a way that you know the lifetimes are okay. Um, and this is where, where Rust uh, comes to the rescue. Actually, I should point out, um, there have been a few times actually on the Cap'n Proto mailing list that some, some users uh, in, using C, the C++ library um, have run into seg faults because they were not being careful in this way. They were ending up with dangling pointers into a message that you know, had been moved away or had been collected. So yeah, Rust comes to the rescue here. R Rust has a way to talk about this sort of validity question in its type system so we can statically guarantee that we're never going to get a seg fault because of this. So let's see what that looks like. Here's the pixel at function again. Um, but I've so it, I'm, I'm just showing the signature here. And I've changed uh, a few things. In particular, I've added uh, these lifetime annotations. Tick A. Read the first one as for all lifetimes tick A, and then read the second two as uh, constraining uh, the lifetime of the argument and then the return value. So tick A is a lifetime variable, and lifetime variables induce a subtyping relationship on types. So what this actually means, uh, or the constraint that this actually introduces into our program is that the the, return, the lifetime of the return value must live, must be at least as long as the lifetime of the input image, which is what we expect, um, because we're just going to return um, a pointer into the image uh, that we were given. Now, of course, we could implement this function another way, uh, like not to spec. Um, one way that would still pass the type checker would be to re uh, return a, an image reader that lives forever, um, a, like a static constant. Um, that would type check. One way to uh, run into problems is if we returned an image reader that only lives as long as the scope of this function itself. Um, that would lead us to danger. Like, if we, if we were allowed to do that and, and we tried to dereference the thing that we got back, we would hit a seg fault. Uh, so the, the way that you could try to do that in Rust is something like this. So here I'm just uh, allocating a new message builder. That's just saying, you know, allocate some bytes. We're going to write a Cap'n Proto value here. And then I'm initializing it as a color builder and casting it as a reader. And I'm trying to return that. And uh, the, the type system will have none of it. Uh, so cool. That we're seeing that we were protected there from getting a dangling pointer. Here's another example. This is the function called find match. And the idea here is we're going to return a pixel in an image that is most, most like a color that we've been given. Um, so the, the idea, as before, is we're, we're, yeah, we're going to return a pixel that's part of the image that was given. Um, so the lifetime of the thing we're returning, tick A, is the same as the image that we're given, tick A. And 
And there's this independent lifetime, tick B. So one way to implement this function, which is wrong, would be to return just the color itself and say, I found this color in the image. Um, interestingly, uh, the, the lifetime tracker also will have none of this. Um, because A and B are independent, um, this is not a valid value to return. So having these lifetime annotations, actually, they don't just give us uh, memory safety. We actually can use them to enforce, um, at some level, so, some uh, correctness properties. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so where do these lifetimes come from? Uh, to answer that question, I just want to show you a little bit about, like, at the top level, when you're making a message, uh, how you get those uh, pointers to begin with. Uh, so here we're making a message builder. So the malloc message builder allocates some bytes and says we're going to put a, a cat and proto message in these bytes, some buffers. Uh, and, and then we call the init root function, which borrows a reference to that malloc message builder uh, and interprets it as an analysis result. And the point that I want to make here is that 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 borrowing of a reference is where the lifetimes come from. So you can think of, well, let me just write. So the lifetime of this result builder is the rest of the scope there. You can think of lifetimes as being like tied to lexical scopes as a first approximation. So in a slightly more interesting example, um, here, <laughs> We'll see what happens if we try to borrow that uh, message builder twice. So again, we have a message builder, which is a malloc message builder, and we have a result and another result, both of which try to borrow, try to borrow it, um, and, and then both of them try to use it after they've borrowed it. So we've got two lifetimes here. We've got the first one, which lives at the end of the scope, and the second one, which lives there. Um, and this is another thing. Well. First, this is problematic for a few reasons. Um, one is that these are mutable uh, references to this message, and both of them can they can step on each other's toes. Um, so, fortunately, the Rust type system also uh, does not let us do this. Um, I just want, and this error is like it points right here. It says you can't borrow this thing again as mutable. Cool. Okay, so, so all of that stuff, that's like the data side of Cap'n Proto Rust, and that all stands alone. Um, it's in its own GitHub repo, and some people are using it, and it benchmarks, um, it performs like basically on par with a C++ implementation in benchmarks. Um, and you can use it without thinking about capabilities at all, but the time has come to speak of capabilities. A capability in Cap'n Proto is a reference to an immobile, possibly remote object. The capability also carries with it authority to use that object. Now here I'm using the word object. I could just as easily have said uh, ref or resource or actor even. Uh, the, important, the important bit is that these objects can be distributed and they are defined by their behavior. We describe an object with an interface. So here I'm continuing to write uh, my schema. Um, and I have an interface that describes the, the image analyzer. This interface has a single method called analyze and it takes an image, um, image as input and returns analysis result as output. And again, the image and the analysis result, those were the types that we defined previously. So the, the Rust code that that generates, just a quick look at it, um, looks something like this. Again, we get a module 
called image analyzer and a trait called server, which has an analyze method. And the trait is something we can implement. So if we have a Rust object that implements that trait, we can pass it to the Cap'n Proto RPC system and then be able to call it remotely. I'll get into an example usage of that in a minute, but first I'd like to talk a little bit about the implementation of the remote procedure call system. So as far as I'm concerned, like the main engineering challenge uh, with that is in dealing with uh, the, concur the concurrency. Uh, because we're, we're forced to cope with the fact that you know, when we have a server, requests can come in non-deterministically from multiple sources. Uh, and when we make a request as a client, we don't know when, if ever, it's going to return. So we need some sort of concurrency support. Fortunately, uh, Rust has some really nice concurrency abstractions we can build upon. So tasks. Tasks in Rust are independent threads of execution that use Rust's type system to statically prevent a lot of common concurrency errors, such as data races. And they do that by um, strictly enforcing that a task can only uh, mutate memory that is local to that task or that is owned by that task. Of course, you need to communicate between tasks. Um, and and the, the main way you do that is through channels. A channel is just a place where you can, where one task can put some data and another task can receive that data, perhaps synchronously, perhaps asynchronously at some point in the future, depending on what kind of channel you're using. And so tasks plus channels, um, when you put those together, you get something some people call communicating sequential processes. And I, I really like programming in this model. I had a lot of fun making um, the Rust implementation of RPC using that style of programming. Um, each logical part of the system ends up being its own like little event loop. And the fact that sharing is like only allowed through explicit message passing means that we can actually like naturally scale the system by just like throwing more operating system threads at the program. I should mention here that in Rust, uh, those tasks, you can choose whether they're uh, mapped one to one to operating system threads or whether you use um, so-called green threads in an M to N model. And there's actually a long, interesting story that's unfolding in the in like with the Rust developers and how those are going to interact with each other. Um, I won't say much about that right now. Anyway, in particular, each Rust or each Cap'n Proto object ends up, well, in the way that I implemented it, each Cap'n Proto object ends up being its own Rust task. So it's its own like little thread of execution that's like a little mini event loop that receives method calls and deals with them each one by one sequentially. And I think that's a pretty nice abstraction. Um, here's just a little. Hmm. Here's something nice that like came up in, in the implementation. So this is actually like in, in the uh, the runtime code, the implementation of the remote procedure call system. Um, this is like the event loop, like more or less the event loop that receives. Uh, the calls to a, a particular Cap'n Proto object and dispatches them. Um, I'll, it's just looping through this thing, receiving something, and if something goes wrong, it just breaks out of the loop. And I wanted to point this out because I thought this was a cool pattern or a cool um, instance of being able to use these channels for things that aren't just communication. Because in fact, what this does, I'm actually hook, hooking into this for reference counting. I'm like piggybacking off of the reference counting of the, of the channel object. Um, so when there are no more receivers, okay, so the, the receiver is the, like this task's end of the channel. There are also a bunch of senders. Each capability that refers to this has a sender. Um, when all of those senders are dropped, um, the receiver will get an error here and, and break out of the loop. Um, and then the, the task will go away. Uh, so, so this is a case where in the way that C++ does this is it actually like explicitly each of these objects has reference counting, whereas if we do it this channel way, we get to like piggyback off of uh, the nice reference counting that already exists in the channels. And I just want to quickly look at some client code. Uh, 
guess I wanted to just to point out here that so this is uh, the implementation or an implementation you might write of that server trait, object detector server. I wanted to point out that uh, you're really not allowed to mutate anything outside of what you're given. And what you're given is the structure that you're implementing this on and this context. And the context is just the result or the parameters that you're given and the result you're supposed to write to. Um, and since there are no global mutable objects in Rust, uh, it's like enforced that you only have your own little bit of state. So if you needed to synchronize with other things, you would have like channels inside of your object detector impl. Okay. Now, yeah, there's a really interesting comparison here to C++. The C++ implementation of the remote procedure call system um, takes a very different approach to concurrency. Um, it uses a single-threaded event loop uh, with promises um, and like chaining, promise chaining, in a way that's like quite similar to how you would program in JavaScript. Um, and it has a lot of interesting properties. Um, for one, I, I think it is, in fact, a lot more efficient than the way that I did it in Rust. But I also think that it's... Um, I think it may be less scalable because like you only once you run out of your resources on your single thread, you end up or your, your host. So <laughs> I don't have too much more intelligent to say about that comparison other than it's really interesting and I, I, I want to understand it more. And as the Rust uh, concurrency story plays out as we get closer to 1.0 um, in the Rust programming language, maybe I hope to have a, a better answer about uh, how Rust should Continue. Now, just okay. So, back to like what capabilities are and how we use them. I want to emphasize capabilities are not data; they are references to objects. So they can be passed around within data, but like references in Java, for example, they are unforgeable. You have to be given one by the system. You can't fake it by casting from an integer or a string or anything. So it's more like a file descriptor than like a URL. And that's uh, quite important for the use case that we want here. So like, OK, so coming full circle, back to Sandstorm. Let's imagine our photo album and our image analyzer as separate Sandstorm apps. So when we start, they're each in their own sandbox. They're completely isolated from the outside world. And they just have, well, they have like some they have some capabilities to the system. So one thing they have is, well, let me go back. Nope. Each of them has a reference to this thing called a power box. So OK, so those, those blue arrows, that's how I'm illustrating capability. So the image analyzer has a capability referring to the power box. The photo album has a capability referring to the power box. And I'm, I'm just going to walk through how uh, this uh, communication would get set up in Sandstorm. Uh, so one of the methods on the power box capability is publish. So the image analyzer has this, has this algorithm. It wants to say, I, I can analyze images. You know, come to me with your images. So it publishes its capability. And then the power box um, holds on to that. So that, that green arrow, that's, the power box has a reference to the image analyzer. And then the photo album says, I want an image analyzer. I have these pictures of cats, and I want to detect the cats in them. So it calls the request method um, asking for an image analyzer. And now the key part is that the power box doesn't just do this. It doesn't just hook these things up. It uh, opens a. Uh, opens a request to the user, and the user gets to choose, like, do you want to hook these things up? Um, and if the user says yes, then this capability is passed on to the photo album. Uh, OK, cool. And now, finally, the photo album can call the analyze method and do the things that we've been talking about. And so uh, what this shows is that 
basically, we've like minimized the amount of uh, trust we have to place in these apps. Like, we <laughs> so at the end of this uh, transaction, um, we know that like the only thing more that the photo album can do is is send analyze requests to the image analyzer. Um, if we didn't trust the image analyzer, uh, if the photo album doesn't trust the image analyzer, it uh, knows that it's not getting anything other than those requests it sends. Um, if we as a user don't trust either of these things, we know that like, they still can't make requests to the outside world, um, and so on. Like, yeah, that's all I want to say. <laughs> okay, so that's all. Um, these, the implementations are in GitHub. Uh, the data stuff is in Cap'n Proto Rust. The capabilities in Cap'n RPC Rust. Um, I have a few minutes for questions. Um, and please come talk to me afterwards. I have a bunch of t-shirts and stickers that I want to give out. I have five minutes for questions. Scott. Uh, yes, you can do that. For each, you'd have a separate interface for each of those uh, capabilities you want to provide. A common pattern that you would use is having a capability that wraps another capability and only lets certain methods go through. But yeah, you, you can imagine having like a spreadsheet where you grant a capability only to like some sub uh, grid of it. That kind of rich interaction is exactly the kind of thing we want to enable. In the back. Uh, they are Rust data structures that contain uh, pointers, and they have mm -hmm. a few other fields in them, like uh, like uh, nesting limit. Like there's a counter there that makes sure you don't um, go too deep. Like, because you, you can, well. What? Oh, yeah, order one. It's just, it's a fixed amount. It's just like, there's like five fields or so on, on each of these, or like three fields or something. Okay, over here, um, on the right first, maybe. Uh, you're right or my right? Okay, you, you spoke up. You speak. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the main reasons we have to uh, wrap it in accessors rather than, well, yeah, it means that sometimes we have to have an extra layer of directions. So in the Rust implementation, there's a file called endian.rs that swaps out uh, certain lo low-level methods based on the endianness. Um, or alignments, you know, fixes. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I should have been repeating all the questions as they happened. Um, this question was, how does the size of Cap'n Proto messages compare to the size of protocol buffers messages? Uh, the answer is uh, they're slightly bigger because uh, you end up having pointers. Um, well, you end up with a lot of like zeros in them because um, in proto buffs, uh, you have like variable length integers that like pack down, and you like don't put in fields that are not present. Um, uh, right, um, but there's also a, a custom compression step that you can choose to opt into for Cap'n Proto that like is tailored to this case where where you end up having like zeros in your message, and, and it like deflates those zeros. How does Captain Proto handle extensibility mandatory fields? Mandatory fields. All, all fields are mandatory. Um, well, OK, so all primitive fields are mandatory. Um, if you, if you want to have a field that's optional, you can like just 
use it, have an option to make it a union and say it's either not present or it's there. Um, struct fields are, in fact, if you want to, you, you can uh, distinguish the case when a struct is not present. Like, there is a sort of like notion of a null struct. You can choose whether or not you want, how you want to interpret that. Okay, we, we should take this offline. Um, but I, I'm out of time, actually. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>